beautiful, a beautiful song. So here's the story. Remember, we don't have much about Joseph and Luke. So we'll be looking at the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew, verses 18 through 25. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be pregnant from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man, unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, and to divorce her quietly. But as he had resolved to do this, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus. He will save his people from sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophets. Look, the virgin shall become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they shall call him, they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is there. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had given birth to a son, and he named him Jesus. God had his blessing to the reading of the gospel for this morning. In my house at Christmas time, we have this old singing Santa. Many of you have these singing things. You know, you put a button and they sing a song. Well, this singing Santa is about this high. He's two-dimensional. He's flat like a poster. And he's it's no work at all. But about seven years ago, when he broke entirely and stopped singing, John took to a specialist to have him restored for probably ten times what he was originally worth at the drugstore back in the day. And one lazy afternoon, Mary and I set him up in the dining room and decided to listen to him sing. And he knows 24 tunes, two of which we can't even identify. But the most important aspect of this thing, the reason why we have to restore him to health, is because he is motion activated. Okay, let me let you process that for a minute. It's the middle of the night. We're walking through the living room. Maybe you're at someone else's house and you're unfamiliar. It's dark and all of a sudden you hear, ho, ho, ho. You get the fright of your life. And so, because he's motion activated, we place him in unexpected places around the house every Christmas. And he says, Ho, 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 Merry Christmas. And then he plays it off, one of 24 different tunes. And then he says, Happy New Year at the end. He's used for pranks all season long. Show up in your closet. He'll be just around the corner, behind the bathroom door, possibly under the sheet of the bed. That was a good one this year. That one really got him. Just a little Christmas startle for you. You know, we're downstairs in the kitchen, and you hear, ho, 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 and you go, and you hear somebody go, ah, and you just laugh, and that's the joy of it. That's what's fun. So we just, you know, just a little startlement for Christmas. We're all just trying to get through Christmas without having a singing Santa and do heart attack. But I mentioned this Santa, the important Santa that got restored because we loved him so much. Because I think he's got a lesson to teach us. A lesson that maybe Joseph was really tuned into. A lesson about readiness. A lesson about being prepared for what you might hear. More prepared, less surprised. The angel visitation is shocking. Angels are always saying, 
Fear not, mortals. Be not afraid. Don't be scared. Because they're scaring people. They're going around. Glory to God. And, you know, they have to say, oh, fear not. Oh, fear not. Santa's a little bit late. I mean, he shows up when you don't expect him and you're just... <clears throat> you know someone loves you enough to hide that snow where you would find it at just the right time when everything is quiet and you're gently let your guard down and you're relaxed. Ho, ho, ho. But if you're prepared, maybe it's a different story. Truthfully, how prepared are any of us to receive the message? Mary, Zachariah, most of all had angel visitation in our nativity. How prepared are any of us to receive the message from God? I can tell you myself that I'm, I'm a little rusty in that department. When was it that God stopped speaking to me? When did the Holy Spirit retire? And why? I read the story about Joseph and I think, well, where are my dreams? Where's my angel visitation? And I only say that because it happened to me twice. God spoke to me twice. The first time was mid-1996. Yes, the summer century. For those of you who weren't born yet. It was around 8 p.m. in the Graham Sap Chapel, Warren Willis, Kimberly I was not asking. I was probably in my kind of business, not even thinking about such things. Just sitting in the chapel, making sure the mid middle school kids didn't fart or each other's nose or do something crazy. You know, a little bit of crowd control as a kids counselor. Minding my own business. And then in the middle of the section of the pews, closer to the left in the back, it hit me came upon me. I don't know what it was. A profound experience. Undeniable to me that it was God's voice or some kind of divine voice on my own self. It was not audible. It was not a distinguishable voice, but more of a feeling. But it had great intention and articulation to it. It was probably the full call to ministry, but I softened it down to, I think I'm supposed to go to seminary. I was a college, I was coming college senior at the time, so it was perfect. I had a whole year to prepare all this and get myself to seminary. It was definitive. God, it's tension. It's convenient. The timing. The voice disappeared then again for many years until I needed it in December of 2002. I was staff at this church at the time. But on this night in December, I was on a date with my boyfriend. And things were getting serious. But since he lived in Montana and I lived in Palm Beach Gardens, we used to meet up. There used to be a Krispy Kreme donut shop on Palm Beach Lakes Boulevard. You should not your head. Some people go back to former century. And we used to meet. That was our halfway point. And then I would drop off my crummy car and we'd go off somewhere in his fancy Corvette. Which we had to so, so, so when the baby was seven months old. <laughs> Because we couldn't fit in Corvette anymore. Anyway, so when the date is over, we return to the Krispy Kreme donut shop. The evening has ended, and we're sitting in the car saying our goodbye. And I guess I asked him to come with me at some church event, some like thing. I don't know what it was, some Christmas thing. And he started to complain about getting dressed up and wearing a tie, you know, like he does. And the voice came to me again during this lament. You love this man. To say awkward is an understatement. I don't know how I excused myself from the car and got out of his car, got into my own, and started driving home. And then I called my mother. Again, profound, memorable, undeniably not my own idea. It wasn't in a sweet moment. He was complaining about having to get dressed up and go somewhere with me. Something that I would listen to for the rest of my life. 
But I knew in that moment that something beyond myself, something popped into the top of that Corvette coupe and spoke me. Same way, the same kind of voice. And the voice has been silent now for 20 years. And I'm starting to wonder why. I was obedient to the voice. I became a reverend, and I married the guy from the Christian donut shop. I did it. And I've used these experiences though, as touchstones throughout the years. Whenever I wanted to give up, when mystery seemed too hard, I went back to that pew at the Grim Step Chapel. When my marriage seemed too much effort. I went back to the Krispy Kreme donuts. I have these experiences touched them. They carry me through to the next thing. And I'm sure Joseph had that too. He still could taste the flavor of his dream. Do you know what I mean if you dream vividly? Taste the flavor of your dream. He still could taste that he knew what he had to do. Against all odds, against everything that the culture would tell you to do, Joseph said, I, I know I need to do this. I have this, this experience. I have this dream. I know it was God. Why the voices stop? I'm a bit dull now. I'm comfortably astonished in my career. I guess I haven't needed a message from God lately. I suppose the next one should be, you should retire. Unfortunately, it only comes when you're not looking for it, so I'm anxiously, uh, I'm probably not going to receive that message, um, because I'm all like, hey, what do you think? Is it time? Going to be 50. No. <laughs> you, can't, you can't look for the voice. The voice catches you unaware. That's my experience. I'm sitting in the chapel. There's middle school kids all around me. I can smell their feet. I, you know, and then all of a sudden, God's like, come on, I'm sitting in the car after the date, and he's complaining about wearing the tie, and then all of a sudden, the sky opens up and the heavens come down. When you least expect it, you get the connection with the Pentecost. He's only effective if you're expecting. In his book about Advent, Trevor Hudson, remember that guy I was telling you about last week? He looks at the character of Joseph. And he says, Joseph heard messages from God, he tells us. And Hudson writes that Joseph represents a guided life. And what does that mean, a guided life? Well, Joseph is facing a painful dilemma. He's engaged to a girl who's pregnant with someone else's child. Nonetheless, amidst a people, he knows what he needs to do. He performs heroically. But more than just taking her as his wife, and taking care of the child, he goes beyond that in order to help rescue them by taking them to Egypt, then waits for the dream, to get the news to go back home. He's listening. He's responding. But how does he arrive at this clarity? How does the courage to know what is the right way? Well, Hudson says these three things. He has a threefold task says that Joseph courageously faces the facts. He accepts things for what they are. This is the reality of the world we're living in. Mary's pregnant. The child is not yours. Then he listens. The second is he listens for the word of the Lord, which comes to him in dream. And the third thing is that follows the guidance that he receives. He doesn't just ignore it and say, well, that could be a one-off. In fact, maybe I need to take a page from Joseph's book. If I'm worried about not hearing a voice from God in over 20 years, and well, it took 21 years the first time, should be looking for it right about now. Maybe I need this three-step plan. And maybe you can overhear this sermon, which is meant for me, and it might help you. Number one, face the fact. Evaluate the whole situation. Understand it from inside and out. Consider it. Sit with it. Depend what it is you might need to do. And number two, listen for the word of the Lord. Which could be in a game, for that's how it's come in the past. 
or like a feeling or an idea when planted and not something to be dismissed, but something to be expected. Finally, follow the guidance. I did in the past. Maybe I'm not listening as closely as I used to now. The threefold path that Joseph took, facing the fact, listening, expecting the word of God, and following through, is a good way to be ready, to be prepared for what else is coming in your life. Otherwise, you might be caught unawares, surprised, startled even, and thrown off balance like God is. And that's how you prepare for the same Santa. Over the years, you build up chops to be able to deal with this annual crisis terror in your home. You'll never be caught on air if you look for him around every corner. If you remember when you start to open the door, he might be beside it. If you think about it before you turn the light on, I'm here, ho, ho, ho. You see, Joseph was just ready a match. And he followed God into the future that was unknown and uncertain what happened for the salvation of the world. It was pretty important. And tomorrow is Christmas Day, Ebenezer. Tomorrow is Christmas Day, so it's not too late to listen to God's messages and to follow the example of Joseph and lead a guided life. Amen.